this video I would like to talk a little bit about different types of magic and magicians. <clears throat> and the reason I'm uh, making this video is because I want to, uh, in a way, stop having to deal with all this um, dark magic. I'm getting a little bit too old for that kind of game. But I'm also finding that for the people who are trying to help other victims, it's a very thankless job because your job is in a way like a fireman who's running into a burning building to try to save others and that's exactly what you're trying to do when you're trying to assist the person who's afflicted by dark magic and it's a very selfless and very dangerous job to do and I find that a lot of clients are complaining or not appreciating your efforts because they think that your services are too expensive or how why are you asking so much for so little work and yes maybe i spent only an hour working with the person with a curse but if that curse jumps to me it may take me yeah weeks or months to recover from that and it has bad effects on the health bad effects on the energy body also bad financial effects possibly so um, it's a very high risk job and I do think it is fair that there is a risk reward system so that people who are trying to do similar work get the proper respect and also the proper reward for it which is one of the reasons also I'm making these videos. But yeah, types of magic. Um, so there are really really a lot of types of magic but I'll try to focus a little bit on uh, people who tend to be um, responsible for dark magic. Um, one of the problems I find is that people who are interested in dark magic tend to be very skilled and they are yeah, kind of professional and serious about it because they know they're dealing with something dangerous. Like you don't go around playing with dynamite, you read the safety instructions and you take safety precautions before you do anything. So they tend to be very skilled, very professional in how they work with it. Well, if you look on the more light side, then you usually get amateurs. who People who have, yeah, find something interesting or fascinating and yeah, they like working with it, but they don't really yeah, go in depth and prepare and train um, yeah, to do it in a proper way. So there's a big gap in skill and uh, experience, knowledge, unfortunately, between light magicians and dark magicians. Also, most schools are uh, where people learn magic are dark schools, um, because magic, in a way, by definition, is imposing your will upon your environment. And um, yeah, that tends to attract people who want to impose their will upon their environment, whether the environment wants it or not. So not all mages are serving the other. And <clears throat> yeah, I would personally yeah, think that roughly 80% of mages are more inclined towards the dark arts than the light arts. sad but yeah there's just not as much attraction for people on the light side to go into magic okay types of magic first type of magic is summoning magic this is actually the most common one um, and it can be um, very simple or very complex depending on the person's skill um, so the easiest form of, uh, of this type of magic is basically you make a trade. Like you become aware that there is a spirit and you want the spirit to do something for you so you give it something it wants. And this can be something very simple like you sacrifice an apple or an orange or some piece of yeah, energy to it so that it can maintain its own existence, it has some power to act within this world. And yeah, it can use most of the power you give it to do its own thing and it will use part of the power you give it to do what you want. So this is kind of a mutually beneficial deal 
uh, you can make with uh, such a spirit. It doesn't require any special skills, just an awareness of the spirit and the ability to yeah find something interesting for it to uh, to sacrifice it becomes a little bit more complex when you start to get into summoning uh, summoning is the art of uh, bringing a specific spirit to a specific place so asking a spirit to come to you or to go to a certain location so one way in a way to mess up a person's life is to summon yeah, uh, mischievous spirits and to cause them to go into your victim's house where they will yeah, create all kinds of yeah, mishaps, diseases, problems and whatnot. So the act of summoning is in a way always a little bit disruptive because you're bringing things to a place which is usually not natural to them. Like it can be relatively natural, you ask a forest spirit to move from one forest to another forest, for instance. But more often um, people tend to invite lower spirits into our world um, because there is a certain value to being in our world for these lower spirits and in exchange these lower spirits tend to be willing to offer services. So a spirit which is in a way in its own dimension, which it considers to be very restrictive, very hell-like in a way. Um, yeah, it wants to go to our Garden of Eden <laughs> and in exchange it is willing to yeah, do whatever is necessary to stay there. Um, so you could see them as a little bit like an immigrant worker who is in a way smuggled by this people smuggler into our world and then exploit it. So this type of summoning is relatively easy to do um, because you have your authority over this world. You just need to be able to contact their world, um, which can be done through astral travel, for instance, or a summoning ritual or something else. Um, in the form of trades, you can also trade your own service to a spirit. These are usually higher spirits um, and you will basically make the deal like, okay, in while you are alive, this spirit will serve you and when you are dead, you will serve this spirit. So this is a very typical trade which is made in, uh, for instance, West African and Caribbean cultures, for instance. Um, and it has very strong uh, yeah, benefits, uh, also in Indonesia, and this is often done uh, because these higher spirits have often great powers and also they have a whole army of servants to carry out their wishes. And by making this deal with you, um, yeah, they will ultimately add to their army of servants. So they are kind of having a... Um, yeah, a credit card-like system, so you get things now, but you pay for them later. And this is very typical in black magic that you have a credit card-like system, you get things now and pay for them later, while in the light magic it tends to be the other way around. First you have to put in the effort, then you may get something. Um, when it comes to the summoning, the spirits can also be um, in a way um, that you get a kind of a partnership. So if you work with a specific spirit group or a specific greater power, um, like for instance a, a, a spiritual master or a demon or a deity, that's because you have similar goals, you just yeah, go a little bit out of your way to help each other out. So this is a kind of a union uh, you can make. Uh, so you can become a priest or a priestess to such a power or an apprentice to a, uh, a dark master and this way yeah gain their assistance uh, in this world so um, the summoning practice i think is really the most common form of uh, of dark magic 
think the next most common form is necromancy. Uh, necromancy is, you could say, almost a subdivision of, of summoning magic because you're working with dead things and dead people. So, um, just like any spirit may be summoned, you can also attract uh, a dead person. But rather than, um, in a way, getting this, attracting dead people just to serve you, which is of course a possibility, and usually the necromancer is more interested in um, drawing power from it. Um, so we're all born with a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of talents, and we can of course work and grow and acquire things more. But this is a rather slow and painstaking and very limited process. Um, by using necromancy, you can in a way implant um, other person's talents or powers in yourself. So you are in a way um, constantly upgrading yourself and your own magical abilities. Um, so, for instance, a person died who was very charismatic or very convincing and you would like to have that skill, well, that person's body or energy body can be implanted in you, integrated in you, and then you will have that skill available. So often necromancers are um, looking for not just any dead person, but especially for talented dead people whose skills are more yeah, valuable to take or to copy. And this can of course be combined with another form of service by preventing the spirit from moving on unless it does certain things. Also, the life force itself of a recently deceased person has a lot of power, so you can do very strong magics with it, very strong spells with it, almost irresistible. Um, so the power of, yeah, in a way, using uh, life force is also something unique to necromancy, and this can be the life force of um, something relatively small like a chicken, but it can also be a, a person who died. Um, but usually the, the things which die, which have a lot of uh, unformed potential, they tend to be the most useful because those energies can be shaped into anything. So if an old person dies, yes, there's energy there, but that energy is completely set in that person's emotional patterns, memories uh, of everything which happened to them, their personality structure and everything. So all that energy really needs to be dissolved for it to be able to be put to another use than that person was putting it to. Um, so it is much more interesting to look for, uh, in a way, a baby or um, um, a newborn to uh, to work with because there the potential, yeah, the energy has not crystallized yet so it can be shaped much more easily. Uh, these crystallized energies are also very valuable, but then you want that specific crystallized energy, which is already a certain ready-to-use talent or piece of knowledge or skill, which you can then adopt into yourself. In a way, necromancers are not nearly as dangerous as summoners, because a necromancer is basically focused on self-enhancement. They want to grow, they want to improve their knowledge, their abilities, and this is their agenda. If you're working with a summoner, then they can have a very alien and very risky agenda because there are forces which are hostile to our solar system, uh, hostile to humanity or hostile to development or growth on this planet even. And yeah, summoners are often willing to trade their services for their ser for. Uh, their own services for the services of whoever they're working with. So I find that often summoners might be a lot more harmful to um, yeah, the big picture of, uh, uh, yeah, of life on this planet than uh, a necromancer will be. I'm going to take a little break and then we'll talk about other types of magic.